Are we willing to do what it takes to rid ourselves, as it says in, in 1 Peter, to, to just, you know, everything that so in, gets us entangled by our sin? Is your prayer to the prayer of, like, Lord, you know, empty me of everything that doesn't really matter. Empty me of everything that doesn't honor you. We need to set ourselves apart. We need to be uh, an example in our own home. If you're married, you know, we're, we're the priest of our home. We have an example to our wives. We're to be washing our wives in the word of God, what it says in the book of Ephesians. You know, we are to be an example to our children. You know, we have to have our family unit in order or we're not going to be any good anywhere else. And sometimes we just need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to the simplicity of the gospel. Amen. You know, Amen. it's just, okay, Lord, you know, I'm a stinking sinner, you know, and I'm saved by faith, and, and I need you. And, I, and I, need to, I need to fear you. I need to not just, you know, oh, God, ah, I'm scared of you. But that holy, righteous reverence for God on who he is. He's the creator of the heavens, the earth, and everything in it. And we need to really just like put him in his place. You know, we don't worship God and go to church just because he done something for us. We go to church to worship him because of who he is. You know, he is God Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You know, we answer to an audience of one. We might have somebody in our life that's discipling us. We might have a favorite pastor. We might be involved in our churches. And, and men need accountability. You know, we need to be accountable to someone. And I don't care how old you are, we can still have a mentor, somebody who's more seasoned in the Lord that can always pour into us, that we can always be honest with. And if you don't have that Paul-Timothy relationship with someone, I want to challenge you. I don't care how many years you have walking in the Lord. If you think you've got it all under control, you're on the step of being, you know, in a place where it can be dangerous. We don't make up our own standard. The Bible is our standard. We need to be just, you know, in harmony with God. Living a life that pleases Him. Paul is encouraging the church. You know, I want you guys not just to protect your testimonies, but I want you to be able to share the truth. You know, are we in this day and age, we, I don't know how many of you have, you know, really sensed that there's an urgency in the church to really share our faith because, you know, we've got natural disasters. We have earthquakes. Mexico's been hit three times. We have earthquakes in South America. <coughs> California is on San Andreas Fault. Our earth our world is cracked. It's broken. And we need men to step up to the plate that are willing to share their faith in the business place. Not during work time, but break time. You know, when you're on somebody else's dime, you should be doing what you're paid for. But I'm talking about, you know what? If we're walking the talk, walking the talking, walking the, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing the right stuff. Somebody's going to take notice. Hey, you're different. You know, hey, when uh, there was an opportunity at work and there was like some extra parts or extra tools that weren't accounted for, you know, you didn't take them home. You know, being honest, working with integrity wherever we go, being that example for younger men. Men, young men are looking for truth. I work with youth. I work with our churches. It's, we've been down there in Peru for seven years. We planted a church with a bunch of skateboarders. We did outreaches in the plazas, into the, into the high school, into the colleges, and everywhere we went. And hardly anybody was coming to the Lord. You know, 95% Catholic down in Peru. But we had a semi-pro skater who was on a mission trip, and he gave his testimony and did some of his little kick flips and tricks in a skateboard park. We had 50 kids come to the Lord. We started a church with skateboarders. For the first three years, we didn't have anything, anybody but young men in our church. You know, um, today we've got 20 kids in our children's ministry. We've done eight weddings. Um, we have uh, 12 couples in our couples ministry. My wife has 16 ladies at the house uh, every Monday morning for a Bible study and breakfast. 
You know, we just started a junior high group because we've got these juniors or preteens that are 10 to 13 and they're just too young to really deal with some of the issues that I, that I hammer the youth with. And, um, and so basically, we got 10 of these, these preteens that wanted to start their own group. Came up with their own logo, they want to make their own t-shirts, Adventurers of Christ. You know, we have a, a youth group that's growing, and it's always been growing, and uh, we have these South American missionaries, SAM, SAM, that's like 45 minutes north of us. We're right on the coast, three hours north of Lima. We have a killer break. It's a left point break uh, for surfers. Famous place for surfers to come. But there's this little fishing port that's 45 minutes north, and these South American missionaries that are up there, they're, they're in their 70s, they've been missionaries for 40 years, and it's like... Pastor Craig, um, we don't relate to these kids anymore. Can you come up? We brought a bunch of surfboards out. We took them surfing, and we said, hey, you know, go tell everybody you know that we're going to have a live band and free food at the church tonight. We had 28 teenagers show up for youth group, instant youth group. It's like, so the, the pastor from the Sam base goes, hey, you know, what do we do now? And it's like, oh, my goodness. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll make a commitment to come up every other week. And I'll give you some materials to disciple these kids when we're not there. But we'll, we'll break, you know, so now that these kids that I've been teaching and raising up, now there's a platform for them to just really get some time and practice and, and put it into practice and teach other teens. We have youth teaching youth. We're raising up young men, pillars, columns, the foundation of, of the, you know, building up the next generation, preparing the next generation. We have a school of ministry on recycling four guys in an intense discipleship because I feel that they're going to be the next generation of the church. I'm not going to be around for that. I, 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 I can have a heart attack. I can get cancer. Something can happen to me. And I don't want our church to be dependent upon me. I want them to be dependent on God. So we've taught our church how to be uh, dependent on God and take ownership of the church. And they're trying to be self-sustaining as much as possible. Let me give you a snapshot of, of what it looks like in our ministry. We do church five, six nights a week. We're not just a church. We're a, we're a community. We're a family. We eat together. We break bread together. We're committed to the apostles' teachings. And, you know, we pray together. Uh, we fellowship together. We play together. And so Monday nights, uh, on Mondays, my, uh, my wife has the 16 ladies at our house for a Bible study. Monday nights, I'm discipling majority of our men in our church. Tuesday mornings, I'm discipling these four guys in a very intense <coughs> way. Um, Wednesdays, we have praise and worship at, a, at an evening service. We, uh, we do our praise and worship, and then we have a time where they can share what Christ is doing in their life that week. And then we have a sign-up list where everybody in our church has the opportunity to do a public devotional. I want everyone in our church to be able to open their Bible and do a devotional at their home with their friends. You know, a lot of times we get bad weather and it's like, you know, our teens go, what do we do? Hey, you got a bunch of friends hanging out at your house. How about breaking out the Bible? Hey, that's an idea. You know, and, and it's like, so I want everybody in our church to be able to rightly divide the word of God. And I'm giving them the platform to do so. Thursdays, well, you know, I have a 15-year-old. This is my son, Ryan. Ryan, put your hand. Yeah, that's our 15-year-old. Ryan is involved in the worship band. He sings. He plays the Jim Bay percussion, and he's playing the guitar. But with a 15-year-old, you know, that means that everybody's knocking on the door all the time. And we have an open-door policy. Our house is a fellowship hall. Anybody that goes under the mission field and thinks that they're going to do Wednesday night, Sunday, and that's it is crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to really be relational. It's about building, you know, partnerships and, 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 and raising these people up to, to learn what it means to have a life in Christ. Amen. And so it's a full-time job. And so everybody comes to our house on Thursday nights, all the youth. It's like, okay, we have a projector. We have a speaker. Let's watch some Christian movies. It's cheap to make popcorn and lemonade. And you know what? They're all happy. They're on the floors. They're on the couches. They're dragging in the kitchen chairs. And they're just all over our house. We'd rather have them hang out at our house than to get into trouble. 95% of the young men in our church don't have a father figure. They have a deadbeat dad that has a woman at this end of town, a woman at this end of town. They have a bunch of half-brothers and sisters. Um, you know, that's just the way it is. 
Very, very few have a dad in the church. And so God is restoring lives. Um, we have one of the surfers that got saved at our beach about three and a half years ago. You know, met him. He was addicted to drugs. He was a surfer. He had uh, uh, four kids and was living with the mother of the four kids. And so he gets saved. We marry them. And they, they, he's like my worship leader now. Um, it's kind of neat because, you know, we can see families being restored. He was on the brink of just leaving his wife, and she was leaving him because he didn't have his act together. We had a surf camp, which is kind of like a family camp every year in January. And last January, we had a, a, a family of four come to surf camp, and they were just about ready to get a group divorce. They were about ready to throw the towel in, and they were like, hey, why don't you just try this? And so here's a case that they don't teach you at Bible college how to counsel. He had an affair with his wife's cousin, and she got pregnant and had a little girl. And so, you know, and it's like, okay. You know, it's like, and he's going, well, I don't want to be a deadbeat dad for the little girl. What do I do? I want to see the girl. I want to help the girl. And it's like, and, and it's like going, oh, Lord. The wife's going through some issues about trust, um, restoration, and she doesn't want him going over that place, even looking at her. She hates her cousin, and, you know, and it's like, okay, Lord. You know, only you can restore a family like that. Well, here we are eight months later. She's heavily involved with the church now. He's being discipled by me. Uh, we've got him to where, okay, now we don't want you going and seeing your new daughter without having one of the guys in the church with you. Because there's got to be a trust issue going on where she, your wife doesn't want you in that house with that woman alone. And so, you know, you got to take a brother with you. You know, yeah, are you obligated to support that child? Yeah, okay, I get that. But you need to do it in the parameters where, you know, it's going to honor God. Now you have a, your new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new is come. So let's stay in the solution. We have a, a single father that came to surf camp in January. And uh, his name is John Carlos. And his little son, five-year-old, is named Matias. Uh, John Carlos gave his heart to the Lord, and his actually his five-year-old saw a surfboard hanging up in our sanctuary, and they decided, hey, I want to go there. I want to learn how to surf. And little did he know that it was a church. And when they came, and it's like, and he gets the father gets saved. It was a divine appointment. And then three months later, the five-year-old comes up to me in my living room, and he goes, I want what my daddy's got. How can I invite Jesus into my well, let me explain it to you. And it's like step by step explaining it to this five-year-old. He goes, oh, I want that. Yeah, who wouldn't? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, and so we pray, we hand to the Lord, come to find out, not only three weeks later that he accepts the Lord, he comes up to me and he tells me, my grandpa is doing something that I don't think is right. He's touching me in places that's not, I don't want him to touch you. It hurts. He tells the counselor at school, the school called the police, police investigators take pictures of him. The grandfather has been sexually molesting this young little boy for two years. Mm -hmm. He's got scarring where, you know, where he, there's not supposed to be anything going in. And um, here it is, family, come to the Lord. God knew that they needed his strength to get through this trial. For me, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, it's like I might be angry at God if that happened to my child. I might want to go kill the guy. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I would do, but I know that through the word of God, this guy is handling it a lot better than I probably would. Um, and it's like, and it's just neat to see some, to see God working in the lives of someone. You know, where man, psychology cannot touch. You know, we have case upon case in our church. We're over 60 people in our church now. Um, we have two kids at the Bible College up in the Andes Mountains, and one of the girls that's at Bible College, she came to us three and a half years ago, and her mom brought her to church. She was suicidal. She was cutting herself with razor blades, and uh, she always had a Gillette hidden someplace, and she was cutting herself. They kicked her out of high school. Come to find out. She was raped by her father. She was in prostitution at 14. And, you know, they were at their last hope. She 
we, we, we went to her house and like it was really kind of a scary situation. I'd never been, you know, something you might see on a movie, but I'd never been in a situation like this before. But when her mom called us panicking one night, she just didn't come over. I don't know what to do, our daughter's out of control. We get to her house, the daughter's got blood all over her knuckles from hitting the walls. Her father's trying to restrain her. Her eyes are kind of like back up in her head. She's talking in a man voice and I go, Oh my goodness, I, you know, where in the book of ministry does it say You know, you might think that stuff's fake or it might be some kind of fiction from a movie during the month of October, but you know, we were really in it. And it's like, okay, Lord, you know, I do not know how to handle this. Guide me, direct me, give me some discernment. My wife breaks out the word of God and she starts reading out loud for an hour and a half. You know, I had a little thing of anointing oil. I'm putting it on her forehead. And it's like, okay, Lord, I'm just going to pray. I'm going to pray every prayer that I have. And I'm going to pray until something <clears throat> happens. And we prayed for over an hour and a half. And before this girl became calm. Something that you just really don't want to ever experience. And we went through that. Now, her going in and out of the church and just struggling <clears throat> her whole Christian walk. The last eight months, she's just been on fire for the Lord. The light bulb has gone on. She's uh, really walking with the Lord, and we have sent her to Bible college to get out of her environment where she's at. And she is now giving a good foundation <coughs> on her faith, and she wants to come back and work with children. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing Amen. to see what God can do if we're available. You know, somebody probably invited you to church. Somebody probably invited you to, to a relationship with Christ. I don't know if it was a family member, a friend, a worker, or somebody. But, he, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, brings us to shame when we can see a cult, you know, get on a blanket and pray three times a day when they don't even know who God is. You know, or we get somebody knocking on our door every weekend with a little magazine saying, have you ever heard of the Watchtower? You know, and they got all these nice little pretty words. And if you don't know what you're talking about, if you don't have a, a handle on your faith, you know, it all sounds good. You know, you're good people. You know, and they are. Probably most of the Mormons and, and Jehovah Witnesses are good people. But they got the other doctrine all screwed up. They're not leading people to the Jesus we know. The one that still saves. In him we live, we move, and we breathe. You know, do we have that hope in us that we want to share it with a dying generation? That this could be the end times. Rocket man, earthquakes, hurricanes, you know, all this stuff going on. Do we have an urgency <coughs> to share the truth? We carry around the oracles of God. We probably have a Bible in the car, a Bible in the house, a Bible that we take to church to take notes with. But are you in the book daily? Is that your daily bread? Is that your staple? You know, in Peru, we have bakeries on almost every corner. You can smell the fresh bread early. And you, when you go to the bakery, you, go, you know, you get yourself, you know, a dollar's worth of bread and the, and the bag's all steamy and the bread's nice and hot. It's hard to get home without taking one out of the bag and just munching on it. Who doesn't love bread that comes right out of the oven? Well, you know, it's no mistake that God would use that in the Word of God that, that Jesus is the bread of life. That is our staple, our spiritual nutrition. And if you're not in the Word of God on a frequent basis, you're, you're, you're starving yourself. Malnutrition spiritually. And it's like, if, you know, I, I might be in a place where, you know, we get spiritual warfare all the time. We're in the witchcraft capital of Peru. And, you know, it's like, and if we're not prayed up, if we're not praying in every corner, in every situation, you know, we get hammered. The enemy takes advantage of us. But here in the United States, it's, you know, different circumstances. And it's like, and I'm trying to tell you guys, it's now or never. We need to make our faith real. We need to be able to share the hope <coughs> that we have. Give every man an answer in time and out of time. In season and out of season. You know, do we, are we, can we share what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Do we still memorize scripture? 
You know, the old church, you know, I've, I've been in church that long. I've been saved for 24 years. But, you know, I was taught that the word of God is our medicine. You know, not psychology, not antidepressants, you know, but it's the word of God. It still heals, it still changes lives, and it makes a difference. And if we put it in deeply into our heart, we're not going to sin against it. <clears throat> David had that clue. How can a young man cleanse his ways? By putting the word of God in his heart. And I want to challenge you guys, if you're not memorizing scripture, and you've got a little bit relaxed, it's time to get those little, you know, index cards out again, and just, you know, every morning I'm going to make a commitment to read this verse until I know it by memory. You know, putting scripture all around your house. Well, you know, our family's going through this, and we might be going through that. Well, you know what? Put Bible verses on the mirror. Put Bible verses on the refrigerator. Just before you go out the door, that that's the last thing you see. How about this? The last thing your eyes see before you go to sleep is the Word of God. Well, Pastor, I don't like to read. Well, you know what? They got it in audio. You can listen to the Word of God. You can download an app today and have the Bible on your phone. You can have it in audio. You can have it in any version that feeds your soul. But it's time to get real, man. It's time to get real. And I'm not here just to puff you up. I'm not a motivational speaker. It's the truth of Jesus Christ. It's the truth of His Word. Amen. And what we're doing down in Peru is nothing different than what goes on here. But God has strategically placed me in a place where teens are struggling from the same stuff, the same stupid stuff that I used to do in San Diego, California. Grew up with a skateboard, grew up with a, with a surfboard. You know, I tried to buffalo my dad into thinking that I was a good kid all the time. And meanwhile, I was trying marijuana and I was doing stupid stuff. You know, and anybody who says that marijuana is not an open door to other stuff <coughs> has never been there. You know, I can tell you firsthand, it opened up to 12 years of addicted to crystal meth. I was stealing cars, selling guns, selling drugs, and I had to pay for that. You know, and now, you know, I still pay for it physically. But thank God that he's placed me, and he used the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Got me in a place on the other side of the planet that you have to go to Google Earth to find out where it's at. It's called Watcha. You know, nobody knows how to pronounce it because it starts with an H, you know. Watcha, where's that at? Well, we have a skateboard park and it's like full of kids and I have an old Volkswagen van that, that it's, a, it's a city icon. Everybody knows who I am. I'm the crazy gringo pastor that will go into a, ta <laughs> go into a tattoo parlor and do a Bible study. Then I'll go in down to the skateboard park and talk and sit next to the drug dealers and go, hey, what's going on? You know, hey, don't be selling pot to my kids. You know, hey, who are you? Well, you know, it's like, uh, let me tell you. You know, well, hey, I'm not ready yet, but when I am ready, I know where to go. How's that? You're perfect. You know, I'll take that. Being available is half the battle. You know, the battlefield, the battle is the mind. You know, what do we do? Are we giving every thought and submission to Christ? Are we really doing what we say we're doing? Or are we playing church? You know, and I want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, there's a bunch of young men out there that need to know the truth. You know, there's a bunch of people out there in this Christ-rejecting world that need to know the truth. And believe me, I believe the clock is ticking. I believe this, this is birth pains for sin all around the world. And it's like, and we have the truth. And we can't be quiet. We need to share God's love and truth. I think that's about all my time. Anybody have any questions? What's going on down in Peru? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, is there anything in specific, specifically you use for your discipleship? We have called a school of ministry. I, I downloaded it off the internet. And, um, and I checked it all out, and, um, and if you want, I can send you, it's in English or Spanish, I can uh, give you my email. Sort of like a church's material or something? It's, um, I forgot what, it's not any specific church, it's a ministry, and I believe it's out of California. And uh, I know many churches, like the Calvary Chapels have approved it, but it's not from Calvary Chapel. And, uh, and actually, we're, you know, we're not really 
Calvary Chapel anymore. We're, we're um, a follow up question. I mean, I noticed that uh, you have a supporting uh, ministry, and when I went online to the link, in yeah, the fuel, they didn't really get much of a history of, of, of that, but it has like links to other Calvary Chapel churches. Well, you know, we still, we're still good friends with all the Calvary Chapels. We have a good relationship with them. Actually, our home church now is Cav and uh, the church at Vieira. Um, you know, I know all the Calvary Chapel pastors in Peru. We're still really good friends. Uh, I'm invited to teach at the pastor's conference in January. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the Saving Grace World Missions is where we have our missions agency. And um, it's, you know, no better than any others, except that they take a lower, lower percentage of overhead. <laughs> you know, it's like one of the reasons why we chose them. But it's like they take care of our taxes. Um, they, they help us funnel up the money. They have a, a, a C-1-4 something class. Yeah, I just wondered. Yeah. Just, so, when I look at something like that, I just look for history. Yeah. To try to get an idea, identity. Right. We had to sign a doctrine, a, 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 doc, a faith statement. You know, we agree with certain things. And uh, for them, for us to be accepted by them. But yeah, they're just an agency that helps us to kind of like funnel the money. They send us teams from churches that are still growing that don't have a missions uh, organization. So and where are they headquartered? They're out in Yorba Linda, California. Okay. Yeah, it's called Saving Grace World Missions. Did you have any uh, problems with, uh, you know, with our the, uh, immigration issues with our new president? <coughs> Um, we've had immigration. My wife is Peruvian, and uh, she has her residency green card. And uh, we've applied twice. We've uh, and she passed the test with flying colors, and she still was denied. Um, they said that uh, the the eight years that my wife lived in the United States doesn't count as as credits, and uh, we're spending more time out of the United States than we are in the United States, and they de they denied us. Oh. So in the, in late 2019, we have to come back. And, uh, and we have to get an immigration lawyer, and my wife has to go through that process of getting her citizenship. But we have to be here a minimum of six months from before we can even apply. Um, yeah, we've had immigration issues. Um, my Sorry wife, to hear that. Yeah, and, you know, it's like a, you know, I don't know to tell you, kind of a sticky situation, but I don't think it's any one president. I just think it's the way it's set up. Question. Yes, sir. What would you say is one of the driving forces that's driving you to, to be a, a missionary in Peru? Like, why do you feel as if God calls you to that area? Number one, it's the love of Christ that compels us to share this kind of stuff. You know, I really feel that the Bible uh, says that we all have to be, participate in the Great Commission, you know, and we need to go to the ends of the earth sharing, the, uh, you know, the gospel, the good news, and, um, and I believe that more than ever that we need to be doing that and bring as much people to heaven as possible. Uh, what happened to me is in 1996, um, I was helping out with a youth group and um, I was there for two weeks. We went into the Andes Mountains, we went into the Amazon rainforest and at the end of the trip, you know, we were sharing our testimonies, teaching the word of God, doing dramas. And uh, at the last day of the trip, I was like, Lord, I don't wanna leave. I don't know what you're doing, but it's like, I don't want to leave, and uh, some of you might know my testimony, it's pretty strong, and I made a promise to God one day, if he would get me out of the stuff that I was in, I would serve him with all my heart any way he wanted, and <laughs> that promise <laughs> that I made to the Lord at the end of that mission trip just came right back to me, it's like, remember what you said, and it's like in Isaiah 6, 8 says, who will go for us? And, 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 and Isaiah goes, here I am, Lord, send me. And I really took that verse to heart. The pastor down there in Peru came up to me a few minutes later after praying, and he just said, hey, I want you to come and be our very first full-time missionary. Would you pray about it? I said, yeah. So kind of things unfolded like that. The word of God, uh, <coughs> confirmation in other people, um, having a heart for the lost. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and and I believe if we have that compassion and we're doing it here, not just waiting for God to send us someplace else, but we're faithful in the little things and he'll give us more. Craig, we handle the prayer. Yes, sir. Prayer, Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in it, and that's where we direct our prayers. 
Lord, uh, we ask you to just work in and through us as men. We pray, Lord God, that we would just be about your business. Lord, help us to be in your word. Help us to put your word into practice. To be doers of the word and not just hearers. We thank you for what you're doing, what you're going to do. And uh, we love you. And we need you. And we need to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said it. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Money or anything like that.